our all right everybody as i look i'm gonna do this a lot still figuring out everything um welcome back to keep calm it's just a snake podcast the podcast where it's just as unoriginal with the name as the company that started at jay-z's reptiles um uh, with us today we have a uh, returning guest uh ryan mcveigh and this time his lovely business partner spouse um insert extra titles and all of that jazz erica how are you guys doing <laughs> we're doing good yeah uh better half and there's a lot more titles that go along with that total <laughs> rock star in general. oh oh yeah i yep <laughs> absolutely so you guys just uh this last year decided to roll out your very own reptile uh product line vivtech yeah so um i kind of we spent you know we last uh, we talked before and, and I, I was with zilla before yep. um, so i spent six years as the brand manager of zilla and uh, oh, six and a half and uh kind of saw i got to see really unique aspects of the entire pet industry i mean from every single piece of what we keep pets from manufacturers of food um to pet store chains to mom and pop stores to breeders to everything just stand like the, the people who keep one animal i've seen every aspect of the industry um and it gave me a lot of really unique views and i'm a very big picture person um so as i was looking at this huge picture of how this all works and i kind of found some places that i think were were kind of weak where uh it was it was just i started to see a picture of of, of a i don't know a machine that that wasn't gonna allow us to move where i wanted us to get to as a hobby and okay. that's kind of where the idea of the tech came from. Cool. So, I mean, that's just insane. And honestly, you guys have been going absolutely bonkers with just kind of everything going on. Like, what's, let's see, when did you guys roll out? It was um, in March last year, right? Yeah, it was at the Mark Schomburg. No, July. 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 Yeah. Oh, July that's right, because March is Tinley. Yeah, July, July 19th, Schaumburg okay. is when we launched. Yep. I don't remember our wedding date. He does. <laughs> that's that's totally fine. I I am reminded when my birthday is. So Yeah, no, I remember those things because it's important because she doesn't remember them. But then on normal dude things, I don't remember. Like my girl's ta- birthdays are tattooed on my chest, and I have legitimately filled out paperwork and been like, hold on. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I remember See? all the kids' birthdays. We 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 have we have selective memory and it, it pieces together very well like a puzzle. So mm-hmm. that's good because I, I wish I could say that it worked that cohesively all the time with my partner because there are a lot of times where we'll both be doing like um let's look it up really quick. I'm not sure. There's also oh, yeah. three giant whiteboards in our house, and our house is not very big. There, oh yeah, there are three. I forgot three four more Actually, there's, there's three giant <laughs> ones, three different ones. There, no, there's four. There's no, there's three on the walls. There's, <laughs> there's one two the on the fridge. Room. There's one in the lab or the reptile room. Yeah, there's whiteboards. And there's on one every right surface. by our bedroom. Yeah, but yeah, do you remember to back. actually put things on said whiteboards? I do. Yeah. Okay, that's good. I didn't ever see it. I tell you to do it. <laughs> she yeah, remembers gotta, to tell me to put things on the whiteboard. Yeah. We got a shared like calendar app that we could all plug in and we have like individual colors and stuff. So, you know, we can all figure out exactly where it is. And then I never put anything in. Like <laughs> I was the same way. We tried that and all I did was turn like nope, turn off notifications. I don't want to see this. Yep. Like I, I was supposed to be going to pick up that that lizard today. And then I was like, oh right. <laughs> because i i messed up the time i was like i got enough time to get back from denver no no i do not (laughs) done that done that yep yep cool so um i was gonna say so essentially initially you guys have rolled into what is close to a revolution at least as far as the hobby side goes of reptile husbandry um with the led uvb bulbs and the big part of the reason why they hadn't done that for a while is because of the UVBC issue. Are you guys, are you able to kind of talk about like the R and D that went into that? Because I know a couple zoo people that were working on that, like that side of it. So I was like, cause when I was talking to them about that, I go, you know, I heard that Ryan was, and, and they were working on something. I wonder how they figured that out. And I just like, Oh, Hey, 
if you're able to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when it came to this, uh, honestly, the, the, we didn't invent the diodes, the, the stuff that did that, that the stuff all existed. Um, and it's just been being um, slowly improved over the last decade. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it is true to an extent that the, the, the diodes weren't able to get into the right spectrums. Uh, they had UVC problems. They had, um, and I actually, I did another podcast with the animals at home podcast where I actually showed um, live at the time we had showed a spectrum, my, my computer screen with our spectrometer and showed one of the bulbs that was bad. It was almost all UVC and would kill, it would kill your animal. Um, and it was put out there as a UVB bulb and how it was put out there and why and things like that. Um, so it, there is a lot of bad stuff out there. Um, however, there is, there are LEDs that are in the right spectrums now. Um, they're not perfect yet, but they cover the majority of spectrum so far that, that matter, that we can see that makes a difference. Um, and so far we haven't found there's anything um, detrimental in any of the pieces that we're unsure of. They're missing a small spectrum of UVA that um, there's some concern about, but there's not, there's one study that talks about it. So the research isn't really, we're not really sure about it yet. Um, anyway. But we're still working and, to get it. Yeah. In there. And we're actually, yeah, we're working to fix that. Um, we actually had that for that, we had our manufacturer make custom LEDs to fill that spectrum, um, which are incredibly expensive to just make a couple. Um, but we wanted to do it because we want to see what could that look like? Does it fill out the spectrum like we need it to? How close to actual sunlight can we get by changing out the amount of diodes that are in there, the wattages, how dimmable it is, things like that. So um, we've added dimmability into them. So now our UV bulbs can be ramped up in the morning. Um, so you can actually set your bulb with, like with a herp stat. Mm -hmm. You can actually set your bulb to turn on at seven, slowly ramp up until 11, and then stay at full power from like 11 to four and then slowly ramp down. Um, so like there's, yeah, so we, we've just worked with our manufacturer and the different opportunities that they have and pushing them to um, push their limits on what we believe they can do um, and going back and forth with different designs and different uh, layouts and ideas. And uh, you know, they'll make something, they send it to me, we test it, beat the crap out of it. If you've seen our stories, yeah, uh, I actually pounded a nail into a board with one of them, um, just because, just because, just because I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna drop it. I know my monitors are gonna beat the crap out of it, and I've always been like that. Even when I was at Zillow, like I want to know the furthest I can push something before it blows up, and then I want to make it, you know, I want to fix that, even though there's a one in a billion chance that it would even get to that point. You know, it's, uh, so that's, I, I love torture testing and that's how I want to, you know, do that stuff. So I want to make sure it's going to. Torture testing of our products. Of our products, not yet. Right? <laughs> maybe, maybe our kids, if they really piss me off. Ryan. I'm not aggressive torture, but like, you know, holding books out and stuff. Oh, stop. I mean, they're getting close to teenager age, right? That's. Exactly. It's only going to get worse. Oh yeah. He sounds like such a big badass with this. No, it's better when I threaten them, feed them to the Crocs. And she's like, they're only this big. For now. Yeah. Anyway, so one of the main reasons that we've been able to provide bulbs without UVC and the terrestrial level UVB, which is also a carcinogen, is because we've been able to have these great relationships with our manufacturers and they receive our feedback. And we're talking like we'll get them in and then we'll test them. And every single one of those bulbs is hand tested by me, by Brooke, or by Ryan. And it's exhausting to do it. You're like, gotta test it. And then we test it underneath solimeter, which is the gold standard right now. Cause are you really gonna trust it? We're like, oh, we only use ours. Um, so we test it under solimeter so that what you see if you're using a solimeter lines up comparatively to any other bulb that you have. And so we do test every single bulb that comes through our door. And we've sent back entire shipments because they didn't meet specs and then had like, that we could sell and we just sent the rest back and then our manufacturers like not a problem they take a look at it they rework them and they send them back to us and then we go through the whole process again it's not one of those where we're doing like batch testing um because a lot of larger companies will do batch testing where they take like if there's 100 units, they'll take five out of it and then they'll test all of those or they'll get a shipment of 60 
and then they take one whole box and we'll test those and then just assume that the other, you know, 59 boxes are safe. We don't do that. We put the labor into every single one of our bulbs, which is why we've been able to develop that amazing relationship with our manufacturers. Yeah. Awesome. It also makes us it also makes us a lot more agile, which is really cool. Um, because this is one thing I, I, I hated when I was you know working with a big company is the first order is so many that if anything is wrong, you're just kind of in trouble. Or if you need to change something, even if it's a small tweak, you might have six months of product to get through and thousands or hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars tied up in something. Um, and they just don't move very easily because of that. When you're, when you're a, bat, a giant you know, cruise ship, it's hard to turn quickly. Um, while we're developing the way we treat this company, and I know a lot of the stuff we're saying, testing every single bulb sounds great right now, um, but we say, oh, well, what about one day when you're huge or you get bigger? But we're developing everything as we go to continue to be able to do these things as we grow um, and invest into the, the infrastructure and the time and the money and the people to do that. Um, but no, it's just, it, it allows us to turn so quickly. So um, it's it, with something we actually have to, to, to fix uh, or actually resend is um, Dr. Serena Wonderlich, or Serena, oh, Dr. Serena, sorry. Uh, I was gonna say Dr. Bain, but Serena Wonderlich in Germany has tested our bulbs and has them on a long-term yep. test. Yep. And the first her. call one she has crapped out right away and is just dead right now. I, and, and I have not seen that in any of them that I'm long-term testing. That was testing. our first batch, too. Yeah, and that was the first batch. And we had a couple other weird things happen in that first batch. And we had, so we had the, the second batch that came already had fixed all those problems. Um, and now we're like five iterations later already and adding in dimmable and changing in some of the um, uh, components that are used and the quality of some of the components that are used and a lot of different pieces that we're continuously improving every single time we find an issue. Um, but uh, no, it's just, it's, it's been really awesome to be able to just continuously turn like that and continuously improve our product. And um, I, I will say now, I know that everything we're going to launch isn't perfect. Like we're doing, <laughs> there's a lot of pushback on some of the stuff that uh, even the LED bulbs, like where it's missing that wave spectrum and things like that. Um, and on top of it, there's a lot of other companies that rely a lot on fluorescent bulbs um, yep. that yep. have put out stuff out there that's just not true about LED in general. And there's a lot of miscommunication and a lot of muddy in the waters, but. Um, but UVB was like that to begin with. So yeah. in the history of UVB, this is actually pretty on par. Um, when ZooMed originally launched the first UVB bulb for reptiles, it was blasphemy. You didn't need it. You could keep them alive for however long. And ZooMed actually broke ground with it and was like, no, and pushed it and pushed why it was important. And that was a huge market disruptor. Now we're disrupting a market that's been in place since what? The, 93. Since 93. And now we're disrupting that market further. And that's causing more waves and people that finally have like companies that finally got on board and they're like, yeah, all right, this is our niche now. We're like, okay, well adapt, like, come on, like adapt with the times here. And it's, it's putting a mirror up to a lot of different companies, large and small that need to take a look and say, okay, how do we adapt? Yep. That's, that's awesome. I like that. Cause yeah, there's, I mean, there's pushback so much and just, as you said, that misinformation or misunderstandings, communication, as well as the money, like you said, like once money gets set into something, it's hard to push against. That's why milk is on the food pyramid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, that, that's why dairy people gave money to that to make it so that way that like dairy was incorporated. Government cheese, it's a thing. I've always wondered why cheese was part of it. That's why. Yep. It's essentially the, the way we have everything in is for based on my understanding in the reptile industry, as well as just like our society is today is because groups or people with a lot of money gave or spent to the other right people to do that. And then yeah. it became set as norm. It's why heat rocks are still sold in specialty stores. And yeah, it's, there's a lot of what we call herper lore and misinformation yeah. there. Things like, um, why there's information that ball pythons love to live in tiny little holes and they never come out. That's why a dark tub that with no light and no anything in a tiny little space. Now, granted, 
tubs, racks, I don't have a problem with them if they're done right. But if you take a we even use them. thousand gram ball python and put it in a thing this wide and this long, like you're a jerk. Like <laughs> they don't really do that. But the companies that sold those racks and sold that dark style tub promoted that they live in those tiny little holes and this is better for them. Um, and yes, they do spend time in tiny little holes, but they also climb trees yep. like, and wander around this huge earth that they live on in the area that they live. Like, that's like saying, well, you spend most of your, you spend eight hours of your day in your bedroom. Probably, honestly, you probably spend more time sleeping in your house than you do anything else if you have a job and activities you do outside the house. So like all people only need to be in their bedroom for the rest of their life because you spend the most time there anyway and you're comfortable there. Like it's crazy to me, but it, and, when you, and when you take a lot of those things and actually extrapolate those husbandry ideas out into the wild, I've been telling people this a lot lately start to rationally think, critically think about this thing. What is, okay, so somebody will say, somebody told me to do this and it sounds weird to me. I say, okay, good. So it sounds weird right off the bat. So start to take a look at it. All right, so why does it sound weird? Well, it sounds weird because they said this animal eats this and I don't really think it does. Okay, well, in the wild, would it find that? No. All right, so why are they telling you to eat? Why are they, why, where did that come from and why? And you start to think about that and you can kind of come up with things of why, like, Bearded dragons and their diet is a giant one that I like to talk about. And it's something that's completely related to husbandry and nothing to do with the animal and their diet whatsoever. Um, it's kind of crazy. So when bearded dragons came into the country in the late eighties, um, a lot of them were bred. They were worth a ton of money. They bred all, just like they do now. So a hundred eggs a year. So these guys were like breeding a ton of them. Yeah. And they were growing up and they were feeding them super worms and mealworms because you could just throw a big bowl in there and they just ate them from a bowl and it was easy. These are easy to keep, easy to breed, bred a ton of them, worth a bunch of money, awesome animals. So there was a lot of people investing a lot into them and they were losing these, adu these adults after only a couple of years. Yeah. Um, and they, so they started working with the veterinarians to find out why were these animals dying. And it was because they all had fatty liver. And so the veterinarians were like, well, <laughs> You can't feed them just super worms because that's kind of like feeding your kids bowls of candy every day. And that's it. Like just ice cream every day and nothing else. They're just, they're fat. There's it's, a lot of fat and very little protein to it. Yeah. So it's, it's just not a good. Good supplements though. Yeah. Good treat. Not a good staple diet. So as humans, we want, we're like, well, I don't understand that this animal doesn't eat three times a day. Like I do in a bowl three times a day, like my dog does. And I, it has to eat from a bowl in a, or on some sort of piece of plate three times a day like we do. And you can't explain to people, well, that their metabolism doesn't work the same. They're not a mammal or a different. They're a totally different organism. So veterinarians would tell people you need to feed them less. You need to feed them more active foods, better foods like crickets. And at the time, roaches went wrong, but more crickets and things like that. And people went, oh, now, yeah, I like worms. And they kept dying. So then veterinarians went, okay. Feed them, they're omnivores. Feed them way more vegetation as adults. Just lettuce, tons of lettuce. Not because they need it and that's what they eat, but because it's empty calories and water. Yep. And two biggest things that are wrong, or three biggest things that are wrong with bearded dragons is obesity, dehydration, and lack of UVB or you know hypocalcemia. So you can knock out two of those just by making these people feed water instead of food because they won't listen and understand their animal. That's why, because otherwise we're in the wild, like, all right, babies get 80% insects and 20% veggies. And as adults, it changes where in the world as an, as an animal in the wild, do you come out of your hole, a sexually mature male and sparkles come down from the sky and the desert that you live in turns into a lush rainforest full of vegetation for you to eat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> exactly. Like, like, how could that be a thing? Like how could how could babies who live in the same place eat different things than the adults when they live in the same place, they live the same habitat, they don't do anything different? Like eat, that yeah. being said, there is autogenetic changes that do occur in some species. So uh, yeah. before anybody sends Not hate mail to Ryan, <laughs> I'm Not everything, but like Stop. hold on. Think. There is autogenetic changes. So like Tinosaur, there is um our pectinata, for instance. When we have pectinata they will have an autogenetic change from primarily insect eaters over to herbivores primarily. 
The reason is that that is where they're from. They have plenty of vegetation around them. They have plenty of insects, but they also have plenty of things that want to try and eat them. So they have to get that size faster and we do that through protein. But there is that ontogenetic change. What he's saying with bearded dragons was that this was a human caused dietary change and is not an ontogenetic change because where they are in the wild does not support an ontogenetic change like that, folks. No. So please don't think that there's actually a change that happens in your beardy. That's not it. No, you're correct. There is changes that happen in other animals that allow them to do that. Not all things eat the same thing throughout their entire life. I know that, but well, these guys as adults and babies come from the same place and eat the same things. It does bring up a good point that not all species are even close to being the same, even if physically they look very similar. A mm -hmm. tegu is not the same as a monitor by any means. Oh, yeah. But convergent evolution gives them the same basic body type. Okay, we're back. Sweet. Now, so... <laughs> <laughs> to the genetic change no but we were talking about conversion evolution and you know um the one thing i wanted to point out one thing that drives me insane with that is is just broad brush stroking husbandry like how many tagus do we know of that just get fed rodents constantly because they're like monitors which means they're meat eaters which means that they eat rodents or even within let's even just look at monitors even within monitors they're all monitors so they all eat meat that's not even that's not even kind of true no like there's only actually only a few of them actually really have their diet mainly be meat. Most of them, it's insects, lizards, and frogs. Um, and most of the places that they actually come from don't even have don't even have a ton of rodents or mammals or anything to eat. Like I think we get used to that because we're like, yeah, there's mice everywhere in the United States and corn, and there's mice all over, and there's mice everywhere. But yeah, and there is. But when you're talking like deep in the jungle, it's not. There's not as many small rodents as like, there is, but it's not like that. There's a ton of amphibians and lizards and things like that that are, and bugs and insects, and those are all readily available. Things like uh, all the tree monitor species, they're pretty much straight insectivores and they eat amphibians. They yep. don't, may, maybe once in a while, bird eggs, and even then, not often. Um, we think they live in trees. They must eat birds because they're carnivorous and they attack everything, but... Yeah birds in some of those tropical places are big and way scarier Most they're of not the birds are big yeah they're not chasing away sparrows and eating their eggs down at the farm like it's not, cassowary did he yeah. try and take on a cassowary <laughs> <I know. laughs> right but like there are little birds again there are little birds and things out there like that but yeah um no we're actually excited this next year to get out in, into the field and actually see some of these this stuff and go find these animals and yeah, just you just want to show... see a tree monitor like ninja chop a cassowary. <laughs> no, I just want to I want to show people what these places really, really look like. What is the reality of these places? It's not stop thinking pictures, stop thinking we saw a video where Steve Irwin grabbed a he talked about Komodo dragons, and then he grabbed a, a lace monitor in another video and he talked about how they eat whatever rabbits because they're out there and they do. And then we just went, dude, little lizards eat rabbits and we feed them all meat. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just crazy to me. So like, really, it's it, we really got to stop broad stroking um, husbandry. And it, it, even within groups and genuses of animals, you know, basking, monitors are one I pick on a lot because they get a lot of broad strokes. All monitors bask at 150 degrees. All of them like it hot. All of them like it like this. And it's like, no, actually, our spinulosis, if you get their cage too hot, they'll die on you in a couple of days. Their metabolism goes through the roof. Yeah, they um, have a basking spot of maybe 95. Yeah. You just, did, yeah, you just made an Argus keeper just drop dead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but our spinulosis will, it'll drop dead. We've yeah. had them drop. We've had spinulosis drop dead because we kept them warmer. Yeah. And we I, kept them what would be considered normal for animals in that region. And we're like, okay, we'll try it. Well, it turns out that they actually spend a great deal of time either terrestrially or just going you know a little bit not fossorial but like they, they burrow like dig down and they burrow mm -hmm. also they'll pop their head up out of the you know cork round that's on the floor and then like take off running so they're in hot areas but in the cooler sections of it yep that's... and that was a learning curve yeah yeah and that's not something that I, I promise it's not something you're going to find in a book all the time it's not something you're going to find even in pictures one paper. we found one 
naturalist or one paper that was a just a, a description of seeing them in the wild and it was actually by a friend of ours um and i've talked to him about it a little bit and just how he found them where he saw them how i mean and that's part of what we want to do at some point we want to get over to um the solomon islands as well hopefully next year that'll be a trip we do just to go find spinulosis um and go look at those guys and i want to see like everybody thinks they're tree they're arboreal and they're these tree monitors that's where all the photos were yeah all the pictures are of them hanging on a tree that's because that's where they run when they see you and yep. they are incredibly agile but i had them in so i when i first had them i had them all in vertical enclosures and really a lot of height and they they used it to get up to the heat but they would burrow down yeah. every time. They spent most, they would go up to the heat and then they would be burrowed down in the 18 inches of dirt I had and they, they or they'd be in a cork tube and they would never come out. And then like, unless it was to go up in heat and stuff like that. So just in a lot of their behaviors, it just didn't make sense. But once we basically took it and turned it sideways and gave them stuff off the ground, but mostly burrows and sunk a lot of stuff down into the dirt. Now they're all over the place and they use all of it and but they're not up on things very often yeah they're incredible and they have i know this is a spinulosis tangent but both of us are passionate about spinulosis <laughs> which are spiny nuts um mangrove mangrove monitors, monitors for anybody i don't remember the common names which is sad um it's like the only latin name that i utilize all the time so be impressed people um but they're really cool with the way that they're constantly you know, like moving around their entire enclosure now. And they do preferential UV baths. Um, we've watched it. But what was interesting is they started doing it under our bulbs when we put them on them because you have the UVA, you have the UVB, and they went right to it and they'll like flatten out pancake. And then we've never saw a spinulosis pancake before unless it was in a defensive posture. And then we were comparing um, photos and videos that we had taken of them like previous years past when we were using um, the little like mini fluorescence. level fluorescence, but they're like the push in ones because we could change them out really quick. Yep. And yep. they gave off great UV, but the monitors never stayed underneath them. They actually avoided it actively to the point where like they weren't, they would still get the UV, but they were actively avoiding it or destroying it because they would actually get up and then push those bulbs out. But they never touched um, the plant light that was in there and they never touched any of the heat bulbs and they're not the smartest with heat bulbs. So like the fact that they didn't touch it, but it was the flicker rate that was driving them nuts. When we slow motioned it, you can actually see the flicker rate and it would drive me nuts. So I can only imagine for those guys with their parietal eye and their ability to see UV, it has to be like somebody going in going. Probably looks like a club, like yeah. except way faster and more annoying. And you didn't want to be part of the raid; you just got kind of thrown into the raid. Yeah. So they would actually take it off and break the ball. One of them actually. So he started putting like, in their wa his water. Yeah. So that we wouldn't, we wouldn't put them back in. Yeah. So I had to take them apart, air them out on the on the counter. I had like three bulbs all drying out every couple of days because he. We yank him out and chuck him in his water. And, but when we changed him over to our bulbs, shameless plug, but when <laughs> we put him onto our bulbs, that stopped. And he now basks in the area where the UV is. And it's not because there's heat there and he wants to go see the heat. He actually sits underneath just the UV um, and absorbs it now. That, that actually works because I was going to get into that because um, I did want to talk about the ground. I, yeah, I wanted to talk about your actual products themselves because um, I'm even fairly clear on everything out, but just to kind of lay them out because as we've said, people are now starting to come around to where, oh, hey, just because they can doesn't mean they shouldn't. It's still a good idea, even for the ball python people. It's tiptoeing in there. So what exactly are the different bulb products? We'll start with that because I know you guys are working on other stuff and just brought in some other I things. Call bulb products. You can oh, do, you the other do ball products. <laughs> okay, well, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll start with that. Like, what was the first one um, that you brought on the market? And then I know you have several different variations, for lack of a better term, um, mm -hmm. for different species. So what? And we'll get into those in, in, a, in just a little bit too. But so, what exactly are the actual bulbs that you have now developed? So we have three different bulbs. Um, well, yeah, we have the midget 
because I'm not going to count the other one. So I have Midday Blaze, which is absolutely amazing. Um, the Midday Blaze, it has our highest UVB output, and it also has UVA, and it has um, two 6,500 oh, 6, K points. Yep, I think uh, it only has one. And so that actually has our highest UVB output. That one is actually meant more for very tall enclosures because you want to measure your basking sites based on where the bulb is and then where the actual basking site is. So you can even put it on like a crusty gecko if you have it in something like the size of a shower stall. But, you know, that's how you can measure it just so everybody knows. But we have them out there more for um, the open baskers. So that would be your cyclura who are going to be out in the Caribbean and they're just like being bombarded constantly with refracted um, UV from the water, the sand and things like that. So they're getting it from all angles. Also for any of your large tortoise species that are more of the grassland species, so your hilcadas, your leopard tortoises, the ones that are out <laughs> in the open all the time. And a lot of your apex predators too, because they, like to be out in the open. Our next one down is jungle cover. So jungle cover has, it's kind of middle of the road for UVB. Um, it's very supportive to animals that are in arboreal situations. So that's not just animals that are in the trees, but animals that might be in areas where they're having um, interrupted lighting. And so we're talking more of like your red foot tortoises, um, any of your species like the diamond pythons is a great example. Red tail boas actually do exceptionally well underneath this too. I was going to ask. Um, oh yeah, no, they love it. Um, one of our workers, Brooke, actually has them on her boas and like they'll be like, so how are you? And she has them on her um, Sonoran indigo snakes too. And they just love it. Um, so that's another one that we have is more for your interrupted light um, spectrums where they get their own gradients by going up through like the forested areas or they're just in heavier brush. Mm -hmm. And then we also have our first call and first call has a great frog on the front of it because and we went through a lot of main iterations with this one just so you know. <laughs> but first call is more of the lowest UVB you can get but it has the highest UVA and the highest amount of plant light. So you're still getting that um, visible light to light up your enclosures, but you're not gonna have as heavy of a UVB load. So this is more for your um, cathermal animals or your crepuscular animals. Um, Cause we don't say the word nocturnal. It's a bad word, uh, but we do use it for those guys. And it's for also your amphibians because amphibians, when they are um, starting to metamorph and everything like that, they do need that supplemental UVB. But if they have too much when they're in like the egg stage, it can be detrimental to them. So we wanna make sure that during the egg and the tadpole stage that we're being supportive and careful with them, but also able to help the adults, which is why I first call came to be. The lowest it goes is zone one on the Ferguson zone which is great for those guys. And then you can go up higher so the adults can actually get to a point where they're absorbing more of the UVB benefits as well, which is very important for like our reef frogs. Exactly. So, and then, so oops, sorry. No, we have one more. And that is one that we don't have available currently. Um, we hand out beta testing to some people is our plus fours. Um, that was one that, that might be one that we make into a larger bulb later on for zoo enclosures um, or your more giant enclosures for like when you have a larger tortoise and things like that. Um, but we haven't released those for something that we're really selling. Um, it's actually just for beta testing to see how people like them because currently they're not dimmable. So. No, that it's a three watt bulb that projects UVB four feet. Yep. And so, so we want to make sure we're careful. <laughs> Yeah. So like what I would kind of use, because I have a large eight by four enclosure for my iguanas and my yeah. redfoots, and I have a large mercury vapor for the top part. And then for that only goes down about four -ish feet, then there's a platform that has an Acadia bulb and then a heat emitter for the redfoots and the cyclora when she wants to go down on the ground. So yep. that the plus four would be what could be for at the top, but then I would need supplemental heat as well. Correct? Yep. Because this is, yep. so just just to clarify, because I have a lot of this is, like this is only UV and and plant light, no heat. Mm -hmm. Yes, that yeah, because I a lot of the listeners and a lot of the people I interact with are 
beginner to intermediate, if you want to use that kind of jargon of people that are just getting started or they're moving into more species or larger collections and they're getting past the ball pipe on bearded dragon stage. So for as of right now, you're doing purely light and UVA B emitting bulbs. Yeah. So the reason is the reason that there's no heat, there's two reasons. One, LEDs and heat don't really play well together. Correct. Uh, However, we're working on some things to hopefully be able to combine those into fixtures that allow heat transmission to not be an issue and things like that. So hopefully there's things like that that will be coming in the future. Um, but the other reason is because uh, reptiles don't associate heat and UV the same way that we do. Yes. We associate yes. heat and UV because we go with the sun. It makes the heat. It makes the UV. We can't see either of those things and it makes them so we know that they can see all of those things independently and and see them differently so say us uh, like think about python species there's actually a study recently that showed that animals like pythons like we'll talk pythons have heat pits in their face they can see infrared with optical nerves they see it the optical nerves come from those sensors to their brain they see infrared but that's not what they use to find basking spots. They use they, there's uh, a lot more uh, anic or well a lot more evidence that they actually use uh, UVA concentrations to find basking spots, not heat. And they it, they look at UV and heat independently. And there's studies that show panther chameleons bask and decide how to use their heat and UV independently. In the wild, they can do that. They can sit down on a branch and get heat and UV, and then they can step a foot this way. And now they're in the shade and it's 30 degrees cooler, but they're still getting a little speck of UV on their tail, a little speck of UV on their foot. They're getting refracted UV, reflected UV off the surfaces. So they're still getting the UV they need. When it goes to captivity and you grab a mercury vapor and you hammer them with heat and UV, well, now if they don't want the UV, but they need the heat because they need to warm up their body in order to process the, the UV in, in that process, they don't have an option. They either have to get hotter than they want to be or not have the UV they need or be cool. You know, so there's just, there's, a, there's, there's no way to do that. But by separating them, it allows us to add UV to places where we don't, I don't have heat. Um, and then if you do need heat, uh, halogen bulbs, just the standard spotlight halogens from a hardware store actually are, have a really awesome infrared spectrum. Um, and uh, they do really, really well with a lot of the bulbs that don't produce heat like the LEDs. Um, and then on top of it, if you're using mercury vapors, if you replace those two mercury, or you replace a mercury vapor with one of our bulbs and uh, one of the, the halogens, um, on the first day of buying that versus a mercury vapor, it'll cost you about $40 more. And then over the next four years, you save $400 in replacement and energy costs. Not including what you're spending on gas to get to the store. <laughs> right now, I guess that's, that's going to be like an immeasurable cost to add to that too now. Yeah. <laughs> Don't I know it? That's. So and cool. on top of that, they're only available in um, locally owned um, pet stores. So yeah, that's so. the only people we sell to is locally owned pet stores. So like the small business um, pet stores are the ones that we sell to. And through our website, the only place that you can get them is not only pet stores, but. Well, oh, no. if you're going to drive. <laughs> yeah. Or the shows that you guys attend. And yep, the shows that we're at and things like that. So come see me. It's awesome. And Every you're... time someone donates to use our, oh, I'll start screaming at you. Like, yeah, right. Like a, um, and then also too, if you if you have a pet store near you uh, that you would like to see our stuff at, um, let them know. Wholesale is open and available for them to sign up and register and start getting our products. Cool. Well, I mean, where I'm at, not really a thing, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, send the ones messages that you know of on the Facebook. On the face. On the face. Yeah, I said it that way. I'm on the book of the face. Book of faces. Yep. That's awesome. Hey, I'm old enough to say that now. You are not. I had to. You know, when I had to, when I got my account, you had to have a, you had to have a, uh, uh, a university um, email in order to register for Facebook when it started. You had to be a college. Yeah, student. I was after that, but it would say like, you know, I am or something like that, and yeah. that was how you did your statuses. Okay. Well, and it's the yeah the world's the world's changing and it's not we're starting to see our age now at this point unfortunately let's leave all this old part the, out you can see the gray part right here so <laughs> i know that's why i'm bald you don't see how gray i'm getting 
Oh, I mean, that's that's why I wear a hat. See? <laughs> we're I like the salt and pepper look. That's the only thing we have going for us. And as we get older, apparently it gets hotter. Yay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so VivTech and bulbs and stuff. VivTech, bulbs and stuff, exactly. So <laughs> let's see. I'm just trying to figure out how I want to roll this out there. So essentially... As you explained it earlier, Ryan, that through your avenues and and observations of every aspect of husbandry, the hobby, the industry that has become and everything like that, you noticed a lot of things that you didn't necessarily like or see that were sticking with, you know, as we talked a little bit before about, you know, where the money, where the set is, where we didn't really like that. So for instance, here's one, um, as you've stated, that they seek out UVB and UVA and heat independently, almost as if their natural occurring behaviors that would be exhibited in the wild might potentially be different than our regular husbandry that because we didn't know enough or chose to stick with the money route, aren't behaving the same way. So as said before, why everyone thinks that, you know, leopard geckos, purely nocturnal, and they have to be housed alone, and they are only eat mealworms, and all of these things may not be accurate because of the lack of knowledge when it comes to husbandry, i.e., hey, you give them the uh, early, the first call bulb, multiple hides, a cool humid spot, and you put them in a 40 instead of a 20, potentially they could do better or exhibit more natural behaviors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that's been really, really cool. And I, I, I am begging any of any of our customers that have seen this kind of stuff, post videos, tag us because I'm telling people it happens, but I don't think they believe me. And I actually had a guy come up and apologize to me at a show for not believing me the last time, but the animals can see the UVA spectrum that our bulbs give out. And when you look at a lot of the other UV spectrums of, of like fluorescence, a fluorescent bulb works by energizing um, electrons of mer uh, and, and vaporizing mercury inside of a tube and it creates light, that mercury energized and electrons moving around creates light. And, but it mostly actually creates ultraviolet light and a lot of bad light like UVC. So what they do is they coat it with a powder of different phosphors. And those different phosphors, when that wavelength of UVC or bad UV hits it, it can it shifts it to a different spectrum that's mostly they shift it to the visible spectrum so that's why those bulbs turn put out so much visible light but they also have all of that bad uv so you, uh, bulbs that are for reptiles they reduce the amount of phosphors that are in there so more of that uv gets out and they block off as much as they can of the bad stuff now some of it can sometimes get out but most of the time it's you have to be like touching the bulb to to get to it um, but they also can mess up, mess up those phosphors and things can go wrong, which allows a lot of that bad UV out. But anyway, uh, when you look through the UVA spectrum of those bulbs, it's blocking a lot of it, but there'll be like nothing and then a huge spike of energy where some of that light got through and then nothing where the phosphor blocks it and then another huge spike of energy and then nothing. And I've never seen animals really react to UV bulbs. And that's been something that's really, I think something that if we all think about it, we know they die without it. We know our bearded dragon is going to die if we do not put UV on it and we, or supplement D3 and you know all, if you don't know all that stuff. So if you don't put UV on it, it's going to die. So we put UV on them, but it doesn't change their behaviors. I mean, they don't get more active. They don't do anything differently. They just don't die. But if you take your animal outside, it, they, they get into a basking stance. They act more natural. They get more energized. They're running around. It could be even on a cooler day where it's cooler, it's a little bit cloudy, it's not nearly as nice as it is in this cage, but they act totally differently. And that completely has to do with that giant, spe that spectrum of UVA and how it affects their brains. And our bulb, instead of just being little spikes, actually has a big bell curve through the whole, or like this big curve through the UVA spectrum, and it covers a lot more of it. Um, and because of that, it covers parts of, parts of it where they can see it. Um, so basically they live, think about living your entire life only being able to see black and white and then someone flipped on a light in your, a special kind of light in your house and everything was color like every video you've ever seen where somebody puts on those glasses and sees color for the first time and everybody cries like 
we're keeping them without the glasses. Um, with all of the types of UV bulbs that are out there, they just don't seem to react to it. But when you turn the, the, the shirts on, the Vertec LEDs on, they, they stand up immediately and walk at it and then just bask. Like, and I've had four different people at shows or that order from us actually come up and tell me. Um, and in Arlington, a guy actually, inter he was a, nice about it, but he came up and interrupted me talking to somebody. He's like, hey, I just, I have to apologize to you. And I was like, okay weird what, what's up and he's like at the last show it was at arlington so our last month so he's like at the september one when you came through you told me turn on your camera when you turn the light on and record your animal seeing the light there's a good chance he'll react to it um and actually go over to it and he's like i thought you were full of crap i didn't believe you he's like he did exactly what you said he did he they had a t5 ho uv on him they had the heat light they had a nice cage set up he sat under the heat light and didn't do anything all day like a giant blob of jelly like they all do. And then he goes, so I put it on the cold side in a dome and turned it on. And the second I turned it on, he looked at it, stood up, walked over to it, flattened out, turned dark and basked for a half hour. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, I've never seen him do that except when we take him outside in the summer. And I'm like, yeah. And that's what we see with our monitors. I've talked about on a bunch of podcasts before in years before about my peacock monitors, how shy they are. All of them are out under our yeah, balls. I, I tong fed one for the first time in keeping them. I've been keeping them for eight years. And for the first time ever, I tong fed one. While the other two sat next to it and didn't even care. Like it was, they're just different animals now. They react differently. They utilize their habitat differently. I'm changing up their habitat because their behaviors change. Yep. So, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And I'm seeing behaviors that I'm expecting to actually see when I find them. That's awesome. That's, that's, that's what I like. And that's, that's what I try to tell people. I don't have the, I don't have, unfortunately, like I've, I've started to put UVB bulbs on as many cages as I can. Cause now I have the space to do so. Um, you know, like all my racks are clear. They're much larger than most people's racks, but it's still just the fluorescent lighting in the building. But all the enclosures I've been putting on UVB bulbs or at least, you know, fluorescent bulbs or um, halogen bulbs on all of them. And I'm telling people that they have this marked behavior change. And when I do shows and I bring my big display of like, here, this is what you can put your, you know, juvenile ball python in. And I talk about like, hey, this is how they behave. And this is really cool. And if you do this, you can do these things. And then like they go, oh, that's really cool. And they take your card and they walk over to the big ball python breeder. And then you see them take out like the little deli tub and they're like these with a paper towel. And then they like, they kind of like point in the direction of your big display. And then like, you just, your head hits that. Like, how do you deal with that? Like, <laughs> you, you know, it, you, you have no idea how many times I've been like this, you, this light changes your animal. And they're like, yeah, my animal's alive. It's fine. Like, yeah. Yes. Um, I guess it, it it's kind of crazy to me how we look at this, but it's also, there's, a, I think there's a reason behind it. And, and I, this is realistically what happened. The reason that people are like that is one, because people are lazy and we want everything cheap and easy and we don't really want to put effort into things in general. That's um, and society, thing, yeah. which kind of sucks, but hey, I, like my I know, Hey, no, I'm saying there's a lot of people like that, but <laughs> it, it has a lot to, more to do with how the hobby started. So if uh, you in the seventies, if you're a dude and you catch a lizard and you were like, Hey, so let's see me and you were hanging out where walking around outside hiking in this beautiful, you know, wherever. And then we see a lizard. I'm like, dude, that's kind of cool. I want to keep that. Well, we haven't even put it in. Well, this dude in Milwaukee cut some pizza, like uh, uh, glass out of a pizza place and, and glued it together into a box. And they're keeping fish in them now. So let's put a lizard in it. And that's what happened. And then they're like, all right, we got a lizard, lizard in the box. It died. So it's, we got to put more in the box. Let's put some dirt in the box. Let's feed it. Let's do this. Okay. It's still died. Okay. Well now we need to look at supplementation and what does it need to live? And we, but, and we kind of, it's, it's, if you've ever, it's the dead parakeet theory is how we did, we deal with animals. We bring them in and then we, unfortunately we try and take care of them and they die and we figure out why, and then we tweak something and then they live longer. And then we keep doing that. Um, and that's kind of where the hobby is gone is yeah. one, one step at a time to not kill it until it stops dying. And once it stops dying, you're successful. That's the problem. I don't see it the same way. Not dead is not living. That's 
totally two different things. Existing and not being dead is not the same thing as living a, 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 a healthy, happy, good life. Yep. Like that's very, very different. And I think, unfortunately, as a hobby, we've focused on not dead as a standard instead of thriving. And we're starting to see, I'm starting to see a massive change in that, in the, in the hobby, the wave of changes coming in that. Um, and I think a lot of these, a lot of guys got to get with the program because there's a lot of the early younger generations out there that just aren't willing to deal with you built the cage out of wood and chicken wire and you put in a, you know, a chicken lamp and you're not giving it UV or feeding it calcium and you're just pumping out animals. Like those old days aren't going to work anymore, but that's, there's a wave of change coming. So honestly, it's really just to get past that person. Sometimes you don't. Um, and a lot of times with those guys, there's people that they're just not going to change what they do or how they are. And that's, I'm okay with it. It sucks, but it's not worth, worth wasting my time. I've been told that because I talk about UVA, I'm a scam artist. I'm just care about money and steal, getting money from people. And I'm like, dude, the studies on UVA and what it does to reptiles are from that I use when I talk to people are from the 1940s before the hobby existed. You, you just, it's easier to not believe it and to ignore it. So it doesn't cost you money and time and effort. And the animals don't die, so they don't need it. I can, we're yeah. making millions off of this. What are you yeah, about? exactly. You see my Ferrari. But <laughs> like, honestly, like it's it's more, we got to get the hobby. I'd love to see the hobby in the industry start paying more attention to saltwater. Dude, those guys, yeah. they spend $20,000 on a setup for corals, which is basically plants. I mean, it's the salt, it's the aquatic version, a saltwater version of having plants like, and really expensive plants. And then they take two thought, yeah, $2,000 lights and all this stuff. And then they want to put motion in it. So they throw in like damsels, like $8 fish because they're still pretty or stuff. They can get at like a Petco for $20 and they throw that in there, but the tank is insane and the setup's beautiful. And then the knowledge they have to do that. And the way the household water hobby is, if I came up to anybody and said, "Hey, you want to start? You want to do? A, you want to put a saltwater aquarium in there in your house?" It doesn't even matter if they've ever had fish. Everyone that has ever heard of pets will go, "Oh my God, isn't that really expensive and really hard?" <laughs> everybody does because the hobby set out that way. They set out to say, "Look, it's not easy. Not everybody's just going to jump in and do it. You could lose a lot of money because the stuff is expensive to buy." But if yep. you, so, is reptile stuff. If you actually put in the same amount of effort to build a habitat like a saltwater aquarist does, to build that type of a habitat, it would cost us a lot more money. But at the same time, you could have something that would just, I mean, some of the greatest habitats I've ever seen built for reptiles are some of the, would in comparison to aquatic, like aquarists, aquarists, even some of the best frog keepers could, like, if you were to compare that to the saltwater hobby, that's like your average guy. Like your average saltwater keeper makes a tank like that. Like, yep. so I just yep. think there's a lot more that we can do. But at the same time, I also do believe that we've kind of been screwed over um, in a way that in order for companies to make a lot of money, they have to produce things that are cheap enough to make them viable for us to buy. Yeah. And because we've made the reptile hobby cheap and easy and entry level for anybody, we've pushed it until it's been cheap enough for anybody, which means we made everything too easy. And then we didn't explain, we, 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 the knowledgeable people that built that stuff didn't build, build it with the idea that those people don't have the knowledge to understand why you built it that way. And when you stick it all together and call it a complete kit, a, I can give you a complete, like a complete car, uh, those car build kits. I can give you a kit. You can give me a complete Ferrari kit that has literally every component necessary to build a Ferrari. I promise you, I will still never have a Ferrari. Yep. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. I don't know why things go together the way that they do. I don't know why this attaches to that. I just, I, and you can give me an instruction booklet and I'll follow it the best I can, but is that Ferrari going to be perfect? Is every bolt going to be tightened exactly how it's supposed to? No, it's going to be put together. <laughs> but it's probably not going to work right. And that's the same kind of thing. We give people this Lego set of, you can build anything. You can make this perfect animal but we don't really give them the right, um, the understanding of what those pieces do and why they're important. So they just think they have everything and they put it in and they walk away. 
So we've created some of the problems that we have. And then now we, as, as intermediate and expert level hobbyists, are stuck utilizing the same equipment that those entry level people have because that's where those companies are focused. Now, I don't want them to change their focus because we need every little kid to get into reptiles that we can. I was, uh, yeah. Yeah. I hate it that sometimes they don't get the best information. They go to places that don't have the greatest animal care or whatever. We still need those places to get those people interested. And then hopefully they find your channel and other channels and they find herp societies and they find their first reptile show. And then they connect with us and they really learn, but we're still never going to reach all of them like those companies can. So we need them, but because the major brands have to focus on those companies and those, that group of people, there's nobody that's really stepping out of the box to fill the intermediate expert level and give us the equipment we need to do what those guys in the saltwater side do. And that's a big part of what we're hoping to be able to bring to the table. And I think that's going to be that change is there's, there's an energy in the hobby now that people want that change. They want to build that thing, but it doesn't exist. There's pieces that don't exist. So I don't know. Hopefully we get to a point where that wave of change, we just need to keep feeding it. And that's kind of how, that's the gigantically long explanation of how I get past that. that <laughs> moment. No, also, no, that's... For anybody who has questions, the dead parakeet theory comes from um... Dave Barker. I was trying to remember the name of the book. The oh, Invisible Arc. Invisible Arc. Invisible Arc, yeah. And it talks about how you have to start from, like, you keep a parakeet, and then you learn as you go. And unfortunately, you do lose a lot of your pets, but eventually you get to the point in your keeping skills that you're able to actually, you know, possibly even reproduce them. That's the same thing that we're talking about here. So for anybody who hasn't read that book, go read it, because I'll make the dead parakeet theory way easier to understand. And it also talks about even when that was published, what, eight years ago? Oh, yeah. Ten years ago? Almost a decade. Yeah. About how important it is for this hobby to continue to get new people involved, but also to step up our game. It was probably one of the first books to call out the hobby and say, hey, let's step it up. Yeah, that's um, definitely true. I'd, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's this weird catch-22 that, you know, as, as you kind of said, it's, you see yourself in a lot where it's like, okay, well, I feel like the reason why, uh, you know, the, uh, all of our stuff is getting attacked so much is because it's getting so popular. Like yeah. if, we, if we fight it long enough, it's going to get to be the point where it'll be like trying to take away cats or dogs or other small animals to where it'll be like just an instant. No, that's not going to happen. That's right. why they're fighting so hard now. But as you said before, there's a lot of just, we have a lot going against us, you know. There's a lot of bad news. Yeah, and I, at some point, I would love to see, and, and my goal, and I've said this on a couple podcasts, my goal is that at some point you buy a VivTech complete habitat kit. <laughs> and it literally, you take it home, you plug in an app, you connect it, you put in what animal it is, and it runs all of your parameters for you, gives you feeding reminders, put, I mean, and things like an app, you can put in like, quizzes and things like that get people interacting with their pets and involved in that environment but then actually help them learn at least if we give them a complete kit and they don't understand it all at first if we make it interactive we can teach them why those components work and we can put that information out there and it's just so easy to do that's uh, yeah i was gonna say the other one i have to do this really quick is a big foot plug for the dragon was it the dragon trader dragon traders yeah which is like the complete her history book. Look through that because anybody, you know, talking with you, you know a lot of this, but anybody who doesn't, I don't know if this is a lot. If this is I try to find that everywhere was sold out of it. Like last year, I was. Yeah, it's a yeah, fantastic it's like, book. It's, dude, this is the history. Yeah. It's awesome. But it talks about how our hobby came to be, why, where we started. Like the first snake hooks didn't come around until like what the 80s or 70s or something. It's like the 80s. Probably. Like where they were actually commercially made and not just, you know, a piece of metal. Like sure. this are our, our hobby's really young still, and we need to kind of catch up to some of the other ones like the fish and bird, but Dragon Traders is absolutely a book that I would that I recommend to everybody to read because it talks about so much of where our hobby and her pediculture came from and gives us kind of a kick in the ass to want to make it better because you're like, that wasn't that long ago. 
Yeah. Holy cow, I got to do better. And it gets everybody kind of pumped to do better. Absolutely. That's, that would be nice. Yes. <laughs> That's my channel. <laughs> I was going to go a different way, but I, I like where this is going to end up. Um, so as you mentioned before, like eventually to have like a whole kit, which would be absolutely astounding. Like I even have like little kits that I do because I don't like the prefabricated ones. Like I like to change it up where, you know, I want to add in a digital probe hydrometer thermometer combo. I want to add more sphagnum moss than what is ever available. I want to add multiple hides in larger water dishes to hopefully give people a better start in that. What? Because I know you guys are, you know, constantly working on things um, mm -hmm. as you're moving towards further gradient. Like, are you working on different spectrums of lighting, like colors of lighting? Because I know that's something that a lot comes into where it's like the middle of the day, there's a lot of white yellow, there's a lot of oranges and reds and other parts that they're getting to that point. Um, right now we're, we're really, that's in the five-year plan. <laughs> okay. Okay. That, hey, at, at some point being able to like Way change to throughout out. the day, <laughs> yeah. we'll be working on something like that. Um, it really comes down to, to be totally honest, what it comes down to, um, when it comes down to that is if we're going to use UVA, UVB and create a light that does all of it, mm -hmm they all of those diodes and it would have to have multiple channels so it becomes an incredibly expensive light to change the colors and the uv at different rates and different times and different settings it becomes a very complicated thing um but we are working on one right now that um i'm hoping to do something that would hit more equatorial sun mm -hmm. at like at noon that spectral pattern trying to recreate that spectral pattern along with a, being able to dim up and down. At least then we'll be able to give a little bit of a sun up and a sun down. A lot of the colors and stuff like that, There's, it's possible. It would be incredibly expensive. So that's something down the line that we'll be watching and kind of tweaking with. And I'll, be, I'll continue to be playing with and getting samples from manufacturers. And um, I've got four different projects with lighting happening with our manufacturer right now. Um, all different stuff. Uh, we're yeah, working... So we're working on i'm working on a bulb that you'd be able to screw into the canis the cans in your ceiling and your tortoise would get uv on the floor a that's awesome first of all that's i want it for my house he <laughs> needs that for i'm working on my little tortoise apartment for the larger tortoises and so it's that but um to full circle again what about a multi like a multi bulb outlet similar to the uh, saltwater tanks where you have the different spectrum and different color bulbs in a multi-unit fixture that could, can be controlled with the programmable timer like they have oh, yeah. for a lot of the like a lot of the frag and reef tanks and we can do the same thing again we can do that even yeah. on like strips things like that but again each one each piece even if it's different bulbs or different strips mm -hmm. each thing needs to have its own programming and channel Okay. And it's not. It's not the pieces that make it expensive. It's what it takes to the, to to uh, dim a fixture from di a dimmable Wi-Fi piece mm -hmm. adds a ton of cost when you make it dimmable, or when you and then when you need to now take that incredible cost for a whole fixture and multiply it by six times for six different channels, it can make that fixture go from you know okay it's a two hundred dollar fixture but it does. UVB and all the colors and everything. Well, now all the channels can be changed and it'll do full sun up, fold it sundown. That might be a $1,500 fixture. Okay, um, that okay. is one thing that you do see in saltwater and aquatics, but you're also talking like AI and Kessel and $2,000 fixtures. Okay, yeah, that's why I was like, I was, yeah, it seems like that's, you're it's skipping the middle part right there. That's yeah, it's possible. It just, it bumps, it bumps. You're talking mm -hmm. a price that I think some people would pay for. But, you know, we're talking about a hobby that people pay $10,000 for a snake and put it in a drawer. That's true. So, so it's very, very valid. Fair yeah, enough. That's why that's why I like more about the saltwater. The reason that they don't blink at mu as much at a $1,000 fixture or even for a small tank that's 30 gallons and spending $500 on a Kessel light for it, because the entire setup, they, they understand that there's an expense and that to get that, what, what I want to get that incredible literal chunk of the caribbean ocean in my house i need to pay the money to make the habitat to do that 
Fair. Instead, Fair. we take a look at it and go, I can have that thing in my house and I'll give it the bare minimum it needs to not die. I mean, people don't even do bare minimum for dogs and cats, and we've had those right centuries at this point. So me. Yeah. So I'm I'm hoping that we continue to see that change and that shift and that push. And I think it's continuing to be there. A lot of people are seeing that these animals are smarter and they live bigger lives and their brains are bigger and more complicated than we think. And um, they're not just this prehistoric thing that runs around. You know, they're not dinosaurs. And even then, we don't I even think that's funny. Like, oh, they're just dinosaurs. Look at all the movies. They're all dumb. We never saw one. Like, I'm just I want to put that out there. When we talk about prehistoric animals not being intelligent or, you know, having that prehistoric animal instinct, we weren't here. We don't even know what that means. Like, we're basing it off of bones that got turned into stone and Jurassic Park. And Jurassic Park. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even then, they missed the point of the movie, which is, A, you can't control it. That's the main theme. And B, yeah. hey, they're all bloody smart. They're yes, all smarter exactly. than no, dude, they just gave credit for. I love it. Because people are like, reptiles are just, they're all basic instinct. And I'm like, they can see colors that we can't see. They evolved an eyeball on the top of their brain to regulate a light that helps their body. We need that light too. And our brain just makes us depressed so we will curl up in a ball and eat ice cream. Theirs grew an eyeball to tell them to go into the sun. Yeah, they go and fix the problem. We go. Yeah, yeah. they can smell in 3D. They can, with their, their tongue, with their tongue, they can see infrared. Like, this doesn't sound like a, no, this is just a funny Calm thing down. to me. Because it's like, <laughs> none of this sounds like a prehistoric, like, if I'm describing a prehistoric animal that doesn't think and, like, is real. That would be us. It's a, it's a worm. Like, yeah. you, you, we look at reptiles like they're worms. Like, yep. who, if you take away our ability to fire guns and make technology, we are all food for a lot of crap. And yeah. we're for a lot longer than we haven't been. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, even reindeer see freaking UV. Mm-hmm. We got beat out by reindeer people. <laughs> reindeer yeah. see it because they're like, oh, we like to eat lichen. And lichen gives off UV. So you can identify it. Exactly. Like it refracts it differently. So like they develop that. We still don't have that. And that's a pretty species for us. And we're like, mm, no. Yep. We don't have it. And your dog and cats can see in UV too. Yeah. So it's it's just, yeah, we are like one of the least and crappiest evolved versions of animals on the planet. Uh, and if we, I think if we took a moment to go, huh, these guys lived on this planet way before we did and have evolved over millions of years to live in the environments that they do. And when we want to keep them in captivity, we look at everything that we possibly can in their environment and try and mimic every single aspect of it down to microhabitats. Uh, humidity down in their burrow versus outside temperatures in every region, gradients, leaves, cover, all of it. If we did that and started there, and, and instead of going up until they stopped dying, we started there and pu- slowly pulled out stuff that we realized was maybe stuff that they didn't utilize or was actually a detrimental thing or stressed them out, then we created that perfect habitat. What would that look like in our hobby? And that's kind of where I think we need to look at it. Fair. I mean, it's I baby step it and say like, hey, if you want to get this new snake home, because, you know, I do breed snakes too on a much smaller scale than a lot of people that have a collection my size. But I say, do this like, do this like an aquarium, get your setup, plug it in, and then monitor the temps and humidity for a week and then bring your snake. Like I talk myself out of sales all day long, but that's like that. Uh, that it's responsible and then they're going to have a better experience with their animal and then they're going to come back to you or they're going to turn into the nerds that we are and that's the point the point is to get these little kids to turn into the nerds that we are instead of no nerdier nerdier yeah bad better nerds than we are (laughs) and then and then have them do better instead of get an animal it dies and they walk away from the hobby yep exactly like, yeah, we need to make it easier for them to succeed so that they stick with it. And instead of focusing on making it so cheap, anybody can do it. Maybe we should make it reasonable so people can get into it, but not dumb it down to the point where animals are suffering. Exactly. And it sounds horrifyingly cliche, but the whole children are our future literally is the case for her pediculture. We need them to come in, get excited, and then go and do incredible things like create content that's positive 
for her pediculture to work positive. Yeah. Um, create new products, create apps that we can't even figure out how to do. Like we want them to blow us out of the water. And that's the delivery I think I have to sign for. Okay. Cool. All good. Um, I know. actually have a, a, a technical question. Um, yeah. So ultraviolet does degrade plastic. Yep. Um, you know, with PVC and stuff, it's certainly much more UV resistant than say like a sterilite tub or whatever, mind you. But is that a problem? Is that because of UVC or is that a UVB-AB thing? Because I've never been 100% sure on that. To be totally honest, I don't have an answer for you, but we are doing some testing right now on, well, the thing that's kind of crazy too is LED UV doesn't get, it works, it works putting out the same wavelengths, but not everything reacts to it the same. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like even sensors, we have to buy special sensors for LED and that's with LED in general, even if you're looking at like Lux and PAR and things like that for any light. Yeah. Um, you can't use the same PAR meter or Lux meter under a UV or LEDs, normal LEDs, as you do under a normal T5 or oh, yeah. So like, Our yeah. Spectrometer, we had to do that. We had to send, we have an ocean optics, which a lot of the major companies don't even have, but because it's a very expensive piece of machinery, but it's our, it's our baby because we spent so much on it, but we've had to send it back wants to be calibrated again for an LED thing. And then we had to send it back it's, again for- Right now it's- no, To make it's, sure it reads our- it's, Yeah, it's getting sure completely- it LEDs. Right now it's getting all of the components that we needed to put together in order to re, like measure the light all have to be calibrated as individually and as a unit. Yep. So, okay then. Yeah. We love Ocean Optics. Thank you for helping us because we're like, <laughs> help and they're like we got you yeah. and they take care of it but that is what dr wonderlich uses for testing and what she recommended and so we made that plunge and that's our commitment to providing led but that's also how we found out that one of the bulbs that was you know sent to us as uva uvb was just straight up uvc we're like oh. yeah like it wasn't even it wasn't even really in the but, uvb spectrum on the Ferguson zone, the solimeter that reads for Ferguson zones, the what the UVI? Yeah, the UV index. The yeah, 6. the 5. UV index. That actually showed it worked fine. Like it's like, yeah, you're in this zone. You're totally great. No problem. We're like, oh, okay. And then when you put on the ocean optics, it's like, no, this is a bad thing. Don't utilize this because there's like no UVB in it. It was literally like all UVC on the chart, like do, do, wall. Yeah. So in that, like I said, that I actually went through and talked about that live uh, on that, that uh, animals at home podcast. Cause that was really the kind of point of that one was really showing the different pieces. So anybody should definitely jump on that one. I dive deep into some technical UV stuff. And we talk about, you can actually see the spectrums and understand what I'm, we're talking about when you're measuring UV, what you're actually measuring, what that's all means. Like it's a little bit more of a breakdown. I did a herb society talk um, on Friday night, for Madison Area Herpetological Society, you can find that on their Facebook page too, um, and broke down a lot of how UV works and what does it do and how does it react in the animals and what does that mean. So no, we've done a lot of stuff. So if you search on like VivTech and my name and Erica's name, you can find generally probably a lot of good videos on, on uh, just UV in general and breakdowns and things like that. So cool. Awesome. Well, um, I think that's about it without end up going on like another 20 to 30 minute tangent. <laughs> Um, as we're very prone to do. Um, and I'm sure I'm going to bug you guys this weekend too, because it'll be my very first Tim Lee. Oh, you, awesome. you absolutely should. And I've you had should come to up to the house. The last three Tim Lees I was going to go to. Yeah. So I finally get to go and I look forward to seeing you guys and I'm going to pick up my, uh, I'm going to pick up my solo meter from you guys and to sit Please. there and go mother Fletcher at all the ones that I am running. Um, <laughs> and then pick up a few from you as well. Great. Oh, sure. Yeah. And then, uh, no, when are you coming in? Um, I'm going to be, so I think I gave you a good idea of kind of where I'm at now. Um, it's like 17 hours to Tinley. So yep. I'll be driving to like the outskirt, like the very, like very Eastern Iowa Friday, just all day. And then I'll be okay. coming in to Tinley, um, Saturday morning for the beginning of the gotcha. show. Cause I don't really have a whole lot of cash to go be buying a bunch of new fun stuff. 
Uh, I get to bug well, like to uh, go on Friday then, if that's the case, because Friday is when people get to like walk around sometimes. Like, oh yeah, no, it's um, Saturday morning. Saturday morning, yeah, Saturday yeah. morning, yeah, is when people walk around and get to see, like, ooh, what's going on here. Just avoid that part of the day and then come later. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's. I'll, I'm just gonna be there to go. Ooh, I really want tea. Ooh, I really want tea. Does anybody have Timors? And then just say hi to you guys. <laughs> we, yeah, we, will, have we don't have any for sale we have them they're actually our male and female are a lot have been locked up multiple times over the last couple of days I hey, would. Um, don't, so don't make a girl a promise you can't keep now <laughs> i know but um no yeah and then yeah it'll, it's gonna be an awesome time so i, I can't wait and uh we want our mac lots to lock up oh i know and we're for anybody else that'll be there we'll be at booth 701 right off the main aisle we got a, a permanent spot right on the main aisle this year so i'm pretty excited about that that's awesome Sweet. Well, thank you both so much. Again, I know it's uh, crazy times and super busy all the time. So really appreciate you guys uh, giving me your time because time's important and valuable. Yeah, well, absolutely. And then uh, when you get here on Tinley, or you get at Tinley, I, I'm sure you'll be, you know, doing some recording and stuff. You'll stop by the booth because we're launching a new thing at Tinley. Ooh. Like the next big VivTech thing. Yep, I was going to say, like, I was doing my best not to dive too much into what, like, <laughs> you guys are working on our next step, because I know, hush, hush. Yeah, well, so at Tinley, we're launching it, so you'll have to come over to the booth and show everybody what, how, how the world's going to change again. Okay, well, I'm going by myself, so I'm just going to look for faces that I know, so that's, like, you and Garrett, and that's it, so. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, cool, yeah. thank you again so much. Um, again, <laughs> if anybody out there listening, if you guys want to learn more about Viv Tech, um, please go check out them out. I will put the link at the bottom of this uh, in the description of the YouTube video, and I'll put it in the description of the audio podcast um, to whichever one you guys are listening to at the moment. Um, go check out their website. Go check out, as uh, Ryan said, the Madison Hurt Society. Check out both of their uh, Instagram and Facebook pages, um, Hurt Dad, Hurt Mom, Viv Tech on Instagram. Do you guys do TikTok or because I know I struggle not, doing those? At some point, we're going to hire somebody to do a lot of that other stuff, but it's okay, not yet. Button down there, we're playing on the TikTok. I don't know. Demand, 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 demand. I don't. I don't know. We'll do. We'll. We'll have somebody else do it. But yeah, I'm. I'm too old to do. We'll TikToks. get Ryan to floss on it. I'm trying. I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. Our eight year. We have one eight year old that can do it. What? <laughs> that's all. That's all she does. Yeah, well, that's her dance move. Yeah, that's, hey, that's her, she found her thing. Yeah, the other, we had three other kids, and not one of them can floss well, but one of them, the eight-year-old, folks can do it. I'll, I'll get taught before, before the show. She won't. <laughs> she won't teach me. If I could just get, like, you and Dave and everybody else just sit there and just do, like, a little flossing line, that's a TikTok. I feel like we should it do that. It would be the most uncoordinated flossing line really <laughs> Bunch of basically, this would be us as kids going up to our like uncles and getting them to do something dumb, and then they would all look horrible and stupid, and we'd laugh at how dumb they are. Where that, are those guys now? That's hey, the TikTok. Became <laughs> yeah. like air yeah, for me. So, yep. <laughs> but awesome, cool. Thank you again so much. Um, and now I'm going to go see what the iguanas knocked down because I heard a big crash while we were talking. Um, hopefully they didn't uh, they didn't rip out the actual bulb from the top because uh, yeah. They're good like that. <laughs> if they did, you might need a new one. And I know one that has a really solid aluminum housing and can't be destroyed by uh, an iguana. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's that's what we need to work <laughs> on. Like I said, I, I want to start getting a few um, of yours and putting them on because I mostly keep the, the snakes and yeah. I mostly keep snakes. And so that's what I want to do. I want to put in your um, first call, early riser. Which one was it? First call. First call would be for little stuff. You need like all the plus four crazy ones. We'll talk. Oh, we'll talk no, no, no. I mean, like, um, like on like my, you know, my four foot by four foots that I keep like my pine snake in or. Oh, like e even then, or, um, it, even then it would be jungle cover or midday okay. blaze. You still got, it's about, it's not about, that's one thing too. It's not about the snake. It's about how far away it is. It's that, all yeah. about the distance. So. Yeah, that's, yeah. We'll, we'll talk more in depth. Oh yeah. For sure. Oh, yeah. I was. Trying to keep it fairly not super in depth because I've made that mistake before. So, <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. But cool. So thank you again. Uh, hope everybody's having a great day, and we'll look forward to hearing you more 
uh, for future episodes of the podcast. And again, go check out VimTech. Uh, swear by them already. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.